So, um, I'll do some introductions, but of course, this is supposed to be interactive, so I have some questions for the panelists, but I also encourage people to think about questions as we go through this, um, and also just if you came with questions, that's fantastic. We do have one mic over here, uh, so feel free to line up. Um, just to give you fair warning, it'll probably take us five or ten minutes to get through the initial questions that I'm going to ask, just so you understand who's here today uh, to share information. Uh, but of course, uh, this is going to be most effective and, and most meaningful if you have questions for them as well. Uh, so that being said, I do want to say just a, a few things uh, before we get started, and, and I'll be brief, but uh, one of those is that you've heard us discuss the theme of Jamf and, and so um, I've talked about automated workflows and I've talked about the value of data sharing. Um, here in this, this big data panel, you're going to see flavors of that. So you'll see some solutions where what we're really doing is we're sharing data between platforms to make that, that data very meaningful. And in other ways, there's automated workflows and other things that come as a part of that. So this is really an extension of that theme of Jamf and, and it comes to flavor with the partners and sponsors and people who make that possible. And that's our panelists here who have come to JNUC and have wonderful stories to tell. So. Um, I'm going to start just by giving you names so that you understand the people, and then I'll run back through um, and we'll introduce them and have them say a little bit about themselves. That'll give you an idea of who's here, and then you might have questions for specific people, but otherwise, uh, we do have one microphone, and I will pass this across the various panelists. Oh, two now. Okay, great. So, uh, panelists, if you have something to say in remark to somebody else or you want to chime in, just go ahead and raise, raise your flag, uh, go tap somebody, grab the mic from them, whatever you need to do. All right. Uh, can I can I say there are a few seats left in the front if you want to move forward? <laughs> All right, very good. Now um, I'll start just here and I'll work my way down. So this is Ben Greiner. Ben is from Forget Computers and has the Solution Robot Cloud dashboard, which you've seen before. Uh, we no noted that in the keynote. We have Yev Pusin from Backblaze. And if I say any names incorrectly, just correct me. Um, and then we have Brendan Cooper from Symantec. We have Alan Hancock from Watchman Monitoring. And then another Jamf, Matt Armstrong from Jamf. And he's a member of our research team. So I'll start off with you, Ben. Um, what I'd like you to do is just tell me a little bit about Forget Computers and Robot Cloud Dashboard. Mainly curious about what the problem is that you solve. And sort of like data tells a story. So what's the story that data is telling for you and your product? OK, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, we have been a Jamf customer since 2007. Uh, I think Jamf was about 30 people at that time. You've grown since then. Congratulations. Um, and we are a managed service provider in Chicago. And when we started uh, using Jamf uh, we, and scaling our infrastructure, we quickly uh, came to the realization that we were data rich uh, but insight poor. Uh, we were having a struggle to deal with all the data and to find the answers quickly and to find the right answers and not miss critical information that could be helpful in solving problems more efficiently. So we started uh, looking at solutions and decided that uh, it would be best if we built our own dashboard because Jamf had uh, recently at that time um, maybe, I don't know when you introduced your API now, but at some point you introduced your API and instead of uh, us complaining to Jamf that we wanted a dashboard, they said, well, here's our API. And we took that and we built dashboard for ourselves and we got many requests uh, to make that available. So we made that available to anyone who has uh, a Jamf Pro server at the time, JSS. I'm not sure what it's officially called today. Uh, so that's what we did. We, we took the mountain of data that we were collecting and we said, I just want to see the critical aspects of it in a at-glance view, and that, that's how we came to build uh, the Robot Cloud Dashboard. Very good. Now, our topic being big data, I want to point out something very interesting that Ben just said. So he said he wanted to know about key pieces of data, right? So if you have big data, part of that problem that you can solve is knowing which pieces of data are going to be meaningful and actionable to you and to all your stakeholders that need to access that data. So just I thought that was a very good nuance of what you said, those key pieces of data. Um, very good. So, Yev, why don't you tell us a little bit about Backblaze? Yeah, so I'm Yev with Backblaze. Um, we've been involved uh, with Jamp since about two weeks ago. So I am here learning about as much as I can so that I can go back to my team and get more heavily integrated in it. Right now, you can deploy Backblaze uh, through Jamf, but we're hoping to integrate a lot more. And what is Backblaze? It is an online backup 
service. So um, similar to some of the other folks here, we back up people's computers. We have a native application that runs on your Mac. I won't talk about the PC since this is a Jamf conference. We do that too if that's something you're interested in. Um, but as far as the Mac, it's unlimited backup. We charge 50 bucks a month for it. That's kind of the pitch. It's uh, unthrottled, which means we can accept your data very quickly and we can uh, get the data back to you very quickly. One of the things that kind of sets us apart is um, we know that the egress of data is sometimes a pain point. Uh, yeah, you may be able to back up like one terabyte, two terabytes, three terabytes, but what about getting it back? That's kind of a bummer. So. Over the last couple months, um, we have introduced Backblaze 5.0, which made backing up a lot faster. And then over the last three weeks, we've been uh, overhauling our restore system to make uh, the egress of data a lot quicker as well. So um, we also have a service where, let's say one of your, like if there's any MSPs in the room, if one of your client's computers goes down, uh, hard fail, um, we can send you a hard drive uh, with all the data on it. We, you, you give us 189 bucks, we encrypt the data, we ship it to you. The decryption code is inside the uh, little user panel, so you have to log in, um, You know, hopefully you have two-factor enabled. That's very important. I recommend it for anybody that's not using it right now. Um, and then if you don't need the hard drive, if it's just extra space, you send it back to us and we actually refund you the money. We don't want anyone to feel like their data is being held hostage. That's one of the kind of our core tenants is you should have access to it. Um, to piggyback a little bit, um, it, and also in terms of big data, um, we have uh, Backblaze B2 now, which is kind of our Amazon S3, Azure, and Google Cloud service uh, competitor. We're competitive in that space because we were able to design our own cloud storage servers. Uh, they're the big red pods. If you come by our booth, you can see them. Maybe you've seen them in the news before, but um, we do a lot of hard drive statistics and analysis on, on the hard drives that are in those servers as well. Um, but we were able to compete with those big names because we charge half a penny per gigabyte for storage which is about what we're paying to deploy all that storage. So we hold, it's big data, so I'll say the number, because you'll understand it, it's about 400 petabytes of data under management um, that we have in our data centers on spinning disks. So um, we, if, if you have any questions about managing that data, I'll be happy to field uh, as much of them as I can. But um, in terms of using big data, I'll give just a little bit anecdote, because it's in the, in the news. Um, very recently, we've uh, had an internal project where we've been trying to get as much data about kind of our customers. Not the data that they're uploading, but like where they're located, especially geographically. So we've been using their kind of billing zip codes to like figure out where they live. And that's come in handy over the last, we use Tableau. So I, that was one of the, <laughs> one of the things that we were, we were mentioning earlier. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the ways that's been helpful to us, at least being able to manipulate that data and getting insight into like who our customers are is um, after the hurricanes hit and the fires in North Carolina, I was sending out personalized emails to folks saying like, hey, um, we know this is probably the last thing from your mind, but you use Backblaze, here's how you do a restore. Like, we hope you don't have to do it if you were affected. Like, we'll extend the restoration uh, return period as well. So like, just a little nice thank you. And so that's one of the reasons, or one of the ways that uh, big data has been, at least, or being able to manipulate the data and look at it uh, in our stack has been uh, very helpful. Very good, yeah. thank you. All right, and now we have Brendan from Symanage. So Brendan, why don't you tell us first a little bit about Symanage and some of the use cases or problems that you solve. All right, perfect. So uh, yes, for Symanage, uh, we are based in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we're a fully cloud-based solution that does IT service management and also IT asset management. Um, we are kind of transitioning a little bit more to offer more of an enterprise service management because we want you to support your, your internal end users better, giving them a one-stop shop for all the resources that your company provides. Um, something that we're doing, especially uh, around this topic about big data, is being in the cloud, it gives us a unique opportunity to really evaluate trends that are happening with people who are using our tool. So we can start harnessing that down to say, hey, you know, what can we use? Uh, how are people using this tool? How can we help make this more efficient? But then also translate this down to the individual users to make the service desk more smarter um, to fulfill their needs. So main use cases are really just that internal service desk, making sure you're supporting your teams, making sure you're keeping them uh, up and running and um, not having your technology prevent them from you know, managing their business on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. All right, and that brings us to Alan from Watchman Monitoring. Alan, could you tell us a little bit about Watchman Monitoring, 
And what, like, so what are the problems that you solve? Who are you solving those for? And how does that relate to the big data discussion? Sure, thanks. Um, watch monitoring is a uh, read-only agent that is deployed to uh, Mac, Windows, and Linux uh, computers. And uh, we we look through, you know, finding fun problems and send it in a way, a way that works with your ticketing system. It lets you really know this computer has this problem, so you can schedule a time to uh, fix it on your own, you know, on your own schedule instead of waiting for a user to say, "Hey, look, you know, we have this problem." So you know, we're uh, we're dealing with uh, trying to, you know, importing you know, 150,000 some odd reports per hour about the, what's going on and how to surface that in a ticket that makes sense uh, with enough information, but not so much that it's like, "What's going on here?" So. Could you give us just an example, maybe, of one of the pieces of data that you would be looking for? So you deploy an agent down, and it's mm -hmm. uh, it's on the client, uh, doing some analysis. What is uh, maybe a good example data point of what kind of thing it would find and communicate out? Yeah, I mean, failing hard drives or malware. Uh, you know, looking through finding malware and reporting it back. So which user has installed what, uh, and then letting you know like how to go deal. You know, who needs uh, the attention. So finding that out and putting it into a meaningful alert uh, instead of just kind of like. Not getting in, not, not having it blurred in with all the rest of the noise. Right. Um, and next we have Matt from Jamf. So Matt, I know that you're a little bit unique in that you're a, a Jamf employee. Um, you're from our research team, uh, but you've been working on some things that are related to big data and integrations. Could you share some of the work that we've been doing? Yeah. So um, one of the things that Joe mentioned as a theme is Jamf and. Um, so what we've been focusing on is how do we um, add value to customers through enabling data integrations and gaining a deeper insight into the data um, that's available in Jamf. Uh, a few of those, a few of the ways we've gone about that is integrating with analytic platforms um, like Splunk, Tableau, ServiceNow to, to give you the ability to go deeper and do a more meaningful analysis on the data uh, coming from Jamf. So you can look at solving problems, uh, gaining more insight into your processes, and ultimately looking at how you can improve uh, operations and the user experience. Very good. Now, if people do have questions, feel free to start lining up. Um, I'll continue to follow up with some of these discussion points. But you see that we have a, a pretty uh, wide variety of, of services that are represented here, so a lot of different things that we can talk about. Um, there's a couple that I'd like to start off with now. Yev, you had mentioned some of the new things. That's okay. You're not going to need the mic for this. Oh, great. 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 <laughs> you had mentioned some new things that are going on at Backblaze. Um, I'm wondering if anyone on the panel has anything uh, kind of new that they want to talk about. Uh, that if somebody, you know, we just talked about what you do. So some people uh, were not familiar. Now they are. Um, but uh, there's also maybe some new things that they're not aware of yet if they have been familiar. So if, if there's any new developments that you'd like to speak to, um, now would be the time. Uh, we've uh, we've recently uh, released the uh, ConnectWise and Autotask integrations, so that we can uh, help you manage uh, the the devices, you know, the, the computer records that are in our system can match up to the to the, the configuration items there and map. And then if you don't already have information populated within your ticketing, we can just push it in there for you. Uh, it's a one-time uh, insertion. That way, our tickets, uh, and then once a ticket, once that's done, the tickets that we create can be managed through your existing workflows a little bit easier. So, happy okay. about that. Okay, Yev has one that he didn't mention, so <laughs> yeah. get him the mic yep. back. Yeah, yep. you can go first. We'll just go down the line. So, with Semanage, um, and kind of on the same topic of big data, we've been putting a lot of emphasis into legitimately making you a smarter service desk. I know that sounds a little markety, um, but we're bringing a lot of AI and machine learning technologies into our solution. And some of the tangible things that we're going to start offering is, you know, looking at your past ticket trends. And when a ticket enters the system, we're going to start aligning with all other resources that can help you resolve that ticket right away. So maybe there's an old solution article that's been used to solve this before. We're going to bring that to the forefront so you can see it right away. Or maybe a similar ticket was closed five days ago by someone at a different location. We're going to bring that right to you so you can say, hey, here's what they did. Maybe I can replicate the same thing and get this closed and off my queue very quickly or maybe across the country, five different situations are happening all at once. 
Um, and you really just don't see that because things are siloed off within your IT department. Maybe this is a bigger problem that you need to address right now. And instead of it only impacting these, or instead of it impacting your whole company, you can head it off before, while it's just impacting these five individuals. So it's about taking the data and giving you more real-time, actionable insight into what you can do to accomplish. Uh, something else that's pretty cool is we're going to use this AI technology to start doing sentiment analysis on the communication back and forth between you and your requester. So uh, when someone's starting to get a little pissed off at, at the service and, and they're getting frustrated, we're going to give you those warnings so maybe you put them a little higher in the priority, making sure that uh, you, know, you keep those CSAT set scores high and you know, keep your reputation as a service provider very high within the company. So uh, those are just some of the, the pretty cool things that we're working on uh, with our solution. Uh, the one thing I forgot to mention wasn't uh, necessarily big data related, but it is uh, kind of jam and maybe some of the users in the or potential users in the room um, will find it interesting. Uh, one of the criticisms that we've received over the years is that we we're, we're a little too consumery. So over the last couple over the last year, uh, I guess we've been revamping our uh, Backblaze for Business offering. Um, and it scales, it's built on the same great service that consumers use, and if you know anything about consumer-facing products, one of the key uh, things that they should be able to do is work. Uh, and so we've been able to uh, use the same philosophies to kind of scale. So anywhere from one computer, we have clients with thousands, so we did redesign the entire web admin portal. You can get insights into all the different users. We have groups, so if you need people that you want to actually manage restores for, or like let's say you have executives that you they don't want you to have access as an administrator to their data they want to just you to they want you to just handle the uh, the kind of billing aspect um, you can kind of put them in different groups and stuff as well handle it from one central location so we were paying a lot more attention to to the business folks now as well uh, a few things I'd like to mention is one uh, we're sponsoring for the first time at the JNUC so come down to the booth you can get a, a free trial. Um, two, we have an integration with Zendesk. So if you, we use Zendesk. If you use Zendesk, it's a great solution to have sitting next to your tickets a summary of information about your devices. Uh, and we rely on feedback from our customers to constantly make improvements uh, to our solution. So uh, the last thing we did recently was we added a, a weekly email summary. So uh, you know, every Monday morning, you get that weekly email summary of, of what's going on in your dashboard. And um, I know that you gave me a specific use case of how that's been employed. We don't need to name the, the customer that's doing it. But um, if I recall, there was something going on with batteries and warranties. Uh, yeah, we had, a, we had a customer who uh, uh, had a lot of devices, several thousand devices. And uh, when they connected uh, our dashboard to their uh, Jamf Pro server, they realized that they had a whole uh, um, several, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how many, but uh, 10 or 20 MacBook Airs that were about to go out of warranty that had failing batteries. And they had this information, it's just that like a needle in a haystack, with so many devices, they weren't looking for that problem, so it was hard to uncover. And that's really uh, the, the, the value of our dashboard is that in, uh, it uncovers some of those things that you might not even be looking for. And, and this saved them from, uh, you know, having to deal with out of warranty repairs, they were able to get all these repaired under warranty. Excellent. So um, I want to come back to something that you just hit on because it speaks to big data very nicely. But uh, Matt, do you have anything to, that you want to add uh, from the Jam side of things that you've been, you know, demoing at the booth, for example? Yeah, absolutely. Um, got the nerves out of the way, I think. Um, but we've been looking at, uh, or we've uh, recently released a ServiceNow integration. Um, focused on Jamf Pro Discovery um, that, that'll collect your uh, device data, bring it into ServiceNow, and tie into your configuration management and asset management processes in that platform. Um, additionally, for uh, analytics side of things, we've been, uh, we recently published GitHub projects for Splunk and Tableau um, utilizing uh, the advanced search API in Jamf Pro to get both mobile device and computer data into Splunk and Tableau for, uh, uh, to run the analytics on. Um, so we've got a few pretty dashboards canned um, out on the GitHub page that we're looking uh, to build on and eventually push to the Jamf marketplace. So um, I'll come back to uh, one of the things that you said, but 
All of you have Jamf integrations? Yep. Um, why don't you just very quickly, uh, because this is the, the Jamf Nation user conference, um, beyond just knowing what they do and what their technologies are, uh, could you just briefly touch on the ways, um, Matt just mentioned it, but we can work down from Alan. Um, what does the integration with Jamf look like? Uh, our, when our agent does its hourly run, we ensure that uh, the Jamf agent is able to, you know, has been in communication with its Jamf Pro server recently and would let you know that, it, that it's not because maybe it can't do that, but it can still talk to us. Uh, and then we have uh, extension attributes. So instead of having to like write all your own extension attributes for malware or time machine or whatever, you, just installing our agent, basically you, you can bring in our one extension attribute and get all that work done for you. So that's, okay. that's there. Very good. Brendan. So we don't have an integration uh, specifically, but uh, the way people, the way our customers are using it is our asset management module actually has a light duty agent that pulls uh, different peripherals and uh, software titles from your computers and servers into the system. So they're using Jamf as a way to get that agent out to all their devices. Uh, but one of the, the main goals here, we actually have our, our IT manager here that's actually starting to do some research in other ways that we can build integrations and kind of help support you more with your asset management um, areas and how you're do, tying that in with some manage and how you're tying that in with your ticket history so you can get that better overall picture on your asset life cycles. Very good. Um, yeah, so uh, like I said in kind of my intro, we're, we're new to Jamf, uh, but right now you can massively deploy Backblaze to your uh, to your Mac fleet uh, using it. So yeah, as a mass deployment tool um, that right now, I think that is the most basic of integrations. Uh, but what I'm learning is that there's a whole lot more we can be doing. Um, and so I'm uh, hopeful that, you know, by this time next year, we'll have uh, something that looks a lot more uh, robust. Very good. And um, we uh, use the Jamf API to reach out to your Jamf Pro and once an hour pull updated information. Uh, hopefully uh, the plan is in 2018 to move that to webhooks so we have more immediate um, updated information. And we also, uh, like Alan, use uh, extension attributes to get some of that uh, unique information. And uh, those extension attributes are available on Jamf Nation. So. Uh, if you search on Jamf Nation for uh, Robot Cloud Dashboard, um, you, you can use those extension attributes even if you don't use our product. Very good. All right, so you had said something uh, about finding a needle on a haystack, data that was there that people weren't looking for. So it kind of raises the, the big data problem. And you know that's one of the things that is a problem in big data, uh, trying to find the data that's going to be the most meaningful. But I'd like to hear from the panel what you see as big data problems that are out there. For us, you know, we're doing service management and, you know, a big theme right now is everybody wants to automate. What can I automate? How can I have this work better for me? And typically what you hear is that from the technician side and they want to automate something that makes their life easier, which, you know, 100% agree with. Yes, let's, let's, let, let's make it so you can get more work done. But until you're actually looking at the data and kind of looking at it from a higher level, you don't really know what's going to be the most impactful type of automations that are really going to support your whole organization better. Um, yes, we can make your life easier, but if we can make everybody's life easier at the organization and help you fulfill requests quicker and help you, you know, keep your teams up and running, that's really the goal and that's what the end game is. So we just want to analyze that at a different level and help make those kind of recommendations to see what we can do to help streamline your operations. Uh, yeah, I would just like to add to that. Um, making those decisions is really hard, right? So, because you have so much data, and and when we built Dashboard, we had several powwow sessions over the course of several weeks, trying to decide what do we really want out of that data. And there, were, we went back and forth, pros and cons. And at the end of the day, we made a decision, and we sort of had to live with it for a while to figure out is it working for us, and what changes do we need to make? Is this data relevant, or can we replace it with something that's more relevant? So sometimes it, it, it's a very iterative process, but you have to start with something. And I think the challenge is it can be so overwhelming to have all this data. Where do you start? And uh, I, I like to think, you know, you just have to start somewhere and take that next step so you can get better. Yeah, to piggyback on that, uh, when you said uh, in your intro, uh, data data rich and insight poor, I thought that was uh, an ex a place a lot of us find ourselves uh, where we have more data than we know what to do with. And when you look at all of the data you have, it's hard to 
um, find a path to understanding that data. Um, so for us, it was really breaking that down into individual problems. Um, what problems can we solve with what pieces of data? Um, and then building up the bigger picture as we kind of went along. Yeah, so we're, we're a little bit unique in that we're actually trying to know as little about our customers as possible. Um, so our biggest data problem is how do you deploy 100 petabytes relatively quickly, uh, which is like kind of on the other side of the equation uh, a little bit. Uh, less data analytics and more like actual data storage. Um, and so for, for us, that is one of the, the main issues. Um, so Backblaze uh, has been around for 10 years, and we know data very well. We've developed our own servers. We open source that design, so we know cloud storage, and, and we, we know that industry. Um, but uh, you know, as a bootstrapped company, uh, we can't like grow exponentially. So if all of a sudden you need to deploy another 100 petabytes of data, like what does that look like, and how can you quickly and easily do that? So one, one anecdote of an of an issue we had with data was in 2012, uh, I don't know if any of you remember, but Thailand uh, flooded and it uh, kind of soared the uh, the hard drive prices uh, kind of globally. So your average Seagate, at the time it was a two terabyte or three terabyte drive, which would have cost 150 bucks, uh, all of a sudden now costs like 350. And so we use consumer grade electronics, we designed the software to allow for failure, so we don't care if it's, con if it's co consumer grade or or enterprise grade, we've noticed very little overlap in the in the failures anyway. It, it's all the same for the most part. Um, and so I had to drive around uh, the Bay Area. We're located in San Francisco. I had 100, we, and we, in the blog post, we're a very open company. So in the blog post about this, we posted the map that I had on Google. And it was a 120 mile loop going to every Best Buy, uh, Costco, and Fry's to try to get as many Seagate drives as we possibly could so we can rip them out of their enclosures. Normally we buy internal drives, but those were completely out of the market. Um, we needed to deploy external drives. Turns out if you crack open an external drive, it looks a lot like an internal drive. It just has a little <laughs> house that it's built in. Um, so we would crack them open, toss them in our, uh, in our servers, and, and that's kind of how we survived the flood as it's known internally. Um, and so, like the 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 actual idea of you know how do you store all of the data that like some of you guys are collecting uh, like on the back end uh, is kind of what we you know fight with on a daily basis. Um, just quick, so other people can think about big data problems and how they solve those. Alan, did you have something you wanted to add in? Uh, I mean, to, to us, it's about you know downtime planning. Like mm -hmm. if I'm we're running if we're collecting data you know every hour. Uh, what kind of plans we have, like how long can, can we be down, we're planning on what database are we using, are we using Percona or RDS or whatever, like, like what, who's maintaining it, how long is it gonna take to come back up? Uh, those are the, some of the bigger problems that, that, we, that we wanted to, that we architected around. So what are some of the ways, so um, I'll start with, with Yev and then you can think about uh, what, what you wanna say on the topic, but how do you solve that problem? So, um, and where do you see it going? So with data storage, um, you know, how do you see, where do you see that going in the future to make it easier? And then um, back to you uh, when he's done. Uh, when you talk about those problems that you have, what what are some of the solutions you've looked at? Yeah, so it, it's kind of interesting in the future, right? Like um, the, you have companies like Facebook and Google and Microsoft. When they build a data center, they they like basically drop on a square block an entire building where they store all their data. Um, for us, we use co-location spaces because it allows us to be a little bit more agile. So we can, you know, if we need to spin up a bunch of more space, we can go into a colo and say like, hey, we need about, you know, 50, uh, 50 rows worth of storage space. Um, and then we can quickly deploy um, into those. And so the, like one of the questions that we're asking ourselves is kind of what this looks like down the line in a couple of years. Uh, do, you know, do we end up having to build our own data centers or do we continue going down this colo route? And so like an interesting thing, we, do, we still don't know the answer, but an interesting like hybrid strategy that we're, uh, that we're considering is you have different colos and shared locations around the world to make uh, the ingress of the data a lot faster. Um, especially like if latency is an issue. We solve that by having multi-threaded clients and things like that so we can kind of defeat that a little bit. But people still like to know that the data is going somewhere relatively nearby. So having that there for in, e, um, 
to get the data in as quickly as possible, but then moving it slowly on the back end, still having it accessible, but copying it over into these giant, uh, like maybe larger data centers. So we're like trying to think through kind of what that looks like in the future. It's a, it's a fascinating problem. Like we don't know what the answer is. Like we'll continue growing as we can. Um, right now, it seems like the the colos are uh, are the answer, and we have another one that we're spinning up right now as well uh, to to deploy that hundred petabytes I was talking about. But so it's it's just a weird like scale uh, issue that we're dealing with. All right, and then Alan, so you're talking about disaster recovery. What are some of the ways that you've looked at architecting around that? All right, so when we were looking at like, what do you wanna do for our backend? We looked at like, wow, if we ran our own internal stuff, we could tweak it, it'd be so much faster. And then we looked at like, what would that be like, like if like, you know, like two people on our team were out at a conference maybe? Um, <laughs> you know, so uh, like, how's that gonna be? And we thought of it what it boiled down to is that in that case, going with a hosted solution like RDS meant we were, you know, like maybe it was going to be a little bit slower uh, every day, but we're not going to be suffering, you know, like hours of downtime here and there. Uh, so that was a matter of like deciding where do we want to have our stuff hosted? You know, what are the actual downsides to using a cloud product? Um, and for us, it was just, it made sense to go with, uh, you know, with RDS uh, on the back end, even though technically other things are faster or whatever. All right. So, so um, we do have about 15 minutes left. I, I really encourage if you, know, you want to get the most value out of the last 15 minutes, please uh, come to the mic with questions. Um, I want to pick up on something that Brendan had said, though. Um, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned a, uh, an, an acronym that uh, I sometimes you know, have different thoughts about. Um, you said AI at one point. Now, I've always thought of big data as being one problem where you want to store all that data, and then you want to make that data actionable. And so big data in, it, in and of itself leads you into things like machine learning that you can use to apply against that, which leads you into AI, which gives you more intelligence on that. Um, I just want to know what your thoughts are on how that carries forward. How does big data play into machine learning and AI? And um, how have you encountered that uh, in your respective roles? So I talked a little bit about automations as well, and you know the way we look at it is automations are the rules that you're putting out there. This is what you want to happen when a certain certain condition is hit. Um, but then you start kind of looking at the big data as well, and how can you actually use AI and machine learning to help better those processes, help fulfill those easier, kind of take some of the guessing out. So kind of an example that we have right now, something that's already live in our application, and it seems kind of basic, but we are suggesting categories and subcategories on tickets to all users in the system, whether you're a requester or a back-end technician. And we're doing this by kind of analyzing what you're doing um, with your pack, past ticket trends, what the content is of the ticket, um, you know, maybe what the user's doing, and even what the end game of the ticket is when it hits that resolution level. So we're looking at all these different levels and making these suggestions which help facilitate the automations, which help streamline the processes, and also help you bring different conditional areas into these tickets. Um, and why this is kind of helpful is, uh, excuse me, why this is helpful is because it helps you kind of set these ground rules and it helps you kind of build this database and make this AI and this machine learning stronger. So essentially what the vision is of our product team is have this smarter than your requesters. Your requesters no longer have to type anything out, or not type anything, it's find a category or subcategory. As soon as they start typing, it's going to se select that for them. It's going to be smarter than what they would know because they don't really know what your category and subcategory suggestions are. So I think what the future is is starting to remove some of those different questions um, that may kind of cause bottlenecks or may send things to the wrong direction, actually have the machine learning and the AI make the suggestion for them because they're that confident it's going to be correct. Mm -hmm. Anyone else doing anything with machine learning or, or AI tools? Well, uh, we, we recently, sorry, you want to go ahead? Well, we recently turned on the uh, AI feature of Zendesk. So if you have K-Base articles, it will make suggestions uh, in hopes of solving the ticket before you have to actually have a human solve the ticket. And uh, I, I believe in this technology. Trust me, I believe in it. But uh, we, recent, <laughs> we recently had a suggestion to a K-Base article that was just a photo of a squirrel, which apparently we had posted years ago. And I can't even remember why. <laughs> but it was a uh, rather hilarious uh, suggestion from our ticketing system. Well, you know, in, in, in trying to solve this ticket, have you seen this photo of a squirrel? You know, so, <laughs> so, you can, so you can get some strange results from it. I think it's in the early stages, but it's very exciting for sure.
So um, I would categorize that as an AI problem, a machine learning problem, and a big data problem, because you need to not just find the data that's actionable, but ignore the data that's not, right? Uh, Matt, you wanted to say something? Yeah, so when I think AI and machine learning, I think uh, of opportunity to have a deeper understanding of what's going on. Um, and with some of the conversations, um, the, the thought of being able to tie the server action to the device response, to the end user um, experience, and then the possibility to improve on that um, and understand it in real time. Uh, so you, as you look at process improvement, um, and as Apple comes out with things like CoreML to uh, put machine learning on devices, uh, it just gets me excited about uh, future possibilities. So uh, you obviously have data centers, Yev, but um, does anyone else have, like, do you rely on a data warehouse to have all of your data be actionable and performant? I think we all do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We all, yeah. Yeah, that's the whole point. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we all do, and, and, that's, and that is the part of planning on, on uh, that is the part of planning about big data, like how much you're going to take in, how how big is it going to grow, you know, where where are you actually going to put it? I mean, that is that is part of the you know the logistics that I think I hear a lot of people trying to solve uh, here at the conference. I have an yep. about it. Yeah, go for it. So uh, just a quick anecdote about like big data storage. So when we released the um, uh, when we open sourced the design for our storage pod. Uh, one of the pieces of feedback we got was from a, I don't know if any of you are in like research at all, like medical or uh, bio, biological or biochemical, I don't know, any, any type of research really, but we got a, um, a research firm that came to us and they were doing uh, DNA uh, studies and they were like, you know what, we, we, we used to run an experiment, get the relevant data out of that experiment and then we would toss away the rest of the results because they were deemed not relevant for the, the experiment it itself. And it was cheaper to rerun the experiment than to store all of that data. And so when we um, when we released uh, the storage pond design and people started buying them and kind of playing with it, um, when they realized that it was you know it would only cost you like 15 grand to store like 60 terabytes of data, uh, it doesn't need to cost you hundreds of thousand dollars. You can do it for much less. Um, they were keeping the entire um, result for longer, and then that way they came back a year and a half later when they made another revelation that was like slightly tangential, but they had the original experiment. So if anyone ever does any experimentation, like sometimes that's super valuable. And so they were able to just go back to the original data set and pull more interesting information out of it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, so another thing, just you know, we're talking a little bit about data storage and those kinds of things. On the Jamf side, one of the ways that we look about this is, um, as a Jamf customer, I'm sure you are very familiar with log flushing. So we're looking at, from a data standpoint, what data do you need to have that is there and actionable, and what data really is not for those management actions. It's for logging and archival and going out to fetch it when you need it. And so that's one of those things that when we talk about big data, one of the problems that uh, we would hope to create uh, at Jamf is a situation where you have more and more data that you're able to store. Um, and so from a flushing standpoint, um, that's one of the things that we talk about uh, in terms of making sure that some of that data that you might today uh, flush or not necessarily store in another place, uh, we can help you store so you've got that uh, at your fingertips. Now, um, we talked a little bit about data inaccuracies. It came up uh, very briefly, the squirrel, right? So how do you deal with the data that's coming in, and it might not be relevant to everybody, but and ensure that it is accurate? Uh, yeah, well, uh, from our point of view, that's one of the things that we learned when we built Dashboard, is um, we, Dashboard was essentially an auditor to our Jamf Pro server, uh, meaning that sometimes we would see something in Dashboard that didn't line up with what was in the JSS. And that, was, that would cause us to do an investigation. And then we would discover that something was stuck or something needed to be uh, fixed. And once again, that was something that we wouldn't necessarily have known about because we weren't looking for it. We didn't expect it. We thought everything was working. So uh, automation is something that does need to be verified and checked periodically. And even though we didn't plan on Dashboard being an auditor of the JSS, it turned out to be. And it was uh, a pleasant uh, surprise that it was. All right, before we take other responses, we do have a question, so. Hey, guys, thank you. Uh, 
What uh, data-driven insights are you guys familiar with that you see Mac admins often missing out on, not looking for, things like that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm gonna answer your question, but I, I have the benefit of running a support desk, and uh, the benefit is that we are, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, as close as you can get to the customer. And sometimes when I talk to admins who are a little more removed, I see a disconnect. I see a disconnect between what's happening out in the field and what the admins envision is happening out in the field. And so sometimes we have those conversations. It's like, well, I understand that you want it to happen this way, but this is how it's really happening, and, and we need to come together and resolve that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, another thing I see is uh, a lot of times it, uh, it, we, we may have a lot of resources available, like you've got a computer, you can go look at it in the JSS, and when a customer's talking to you, when your users are talking to you, maybe it's a matter of remembering, hey, we need to go and look, because yeah, if I go look at, you know, at the Watchroom dashboard, the JSS, like, wow, w they're talking about their computer being slow, when was the last time it was rebooted? Just, like, being able to, like, think about, like, what other resources do I have that maybe aren't related to their question, but, you know, can, you know, can I use that to help me, you know, solve the problem earlier? A matter of, like, keeping things in front of mind. I mean, one, one of the things that would be really great is if we could somehow augment everything that we're doing and, and figure out what is truly trending, like not just in our organization or our client base, but you know, across the board. And maybe there's some of that stuff happening in Jamf Nation, but then again, not everyone participates in Jamf Nation. So we're not all in the same system. Uh, and, and how can we all get to a point where we can contribute to a bigger, uh, a bigger pie, so to speak, that we can all look at and say, yes, there, there's there's some interesting data there. I don't know. Yeah, that was uh, definitely a struggle for us as we um, got started with these projects. Is um, what is the data that we can make uh, or create the most value uh, for you that you necessarily aren't already doing? Um, so for some things, it was just looking at disk space or. Um, file encryption, um, file vault encryption, the percentages, um, are you running out of disk space, uh, the, the battery is trying to determine if the device is in a healthy state, a usable state for that user um, as an initial starting point to, to help admins manage their fleet. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have just three minutes left. If there's other questions that people want to ask, please come up and, uh, and mention those. Um, I think you know, what we just talked about here uh, kind of resonates back with you know, if, you, if you have big data, that's good. Um, it's not necessarily a problem. Um, it's finding the problems you want to solve with it and then finding the data that's relevant to solve the problem, um, not the squirrels, but the actual data uh, that can help. And, and if you're looking for where to start with that, um, just look at some of those problems that you want to solve, um, and you can quickly identify where you have data that you can leverage. And then it's also that kind of continuous process of improvement of understanding the data that you don't have, and then uh, figuring out how you might be able to get that data so that you have a bigger data problem, but you've solved one problem, right? Um, so I, I just want to, with the last couple of minutes, open it up to our panelists for other things that they want to talk about um, that they might have on their minds and want to share, um, putting you totally on the spot. But we just have a couple minutes left, and I want to make sure if there's things you want uh, to discuss or share with the audience, you can do that. Well, we just came up with an idea, hashtag big data without the squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I would love for somebody to take uh, the idea of big data and solve our healthcare problem in America. I think that's what we, that's what we need to do. Anyone, anyone working on that? Um, well, I would just say, as a as a representative of a backup company here, that um, we're the main uh, pain point for Backblaze is that we're competing with something that's kind of ephemeral, which is apathy. Uh, so I would encourage everyone in the audience that if you know people that like maybe aren't backing up their data, or if you have policies in place that are like, you know, not necessarily uh, adhered to in the workforce, like. Get an, get an automated backup solution, uh, or at least encourage people to do that. So um, it's, like, uh, it's like I say in a lot of uh, interviews and blog posts, like we're, we're fighting with apathy. It's not a Coke and Pepsi situation between like 
you know, Backblaze and the next best uh, cloud backup solution. Like really 80% of people don't do anything. And that is horrific to me, should be to you. So I beseech all of you to go and be my army and get people to back up. I think just to iterate your point is, you know, the best thing is to do is to find a way your big data can work for you. Um, help you streamline your processes. It's gonna be the best way for you to continuously improve the way you're doing business, the way you're supporting your teams. And I agree with you as well. If we can use big data to help with healthcare, that'd be awesome. Um, I would say uh, hunt it out. A lot of times people are, are you know, will, will those like users will know something, but they're not thinking to say it. Uh, so it's a matter of, you know, get out there, you know, send out surveys, you know, find out, you know, ask people pointed questions like when was the last time they thought they had a problem or when was the last time they were frustrated. Uh, you know, search out the data to, to let you know like, what, to, what to look for next. Yeah, and for me, I think it's it's starting with a with a problem to solve. So, what is your um, pain point that you want to address, um, and then getting the data um, necessary, uh, and then piecing together the picture from end to end. Um, and as Jamf um, looks at expanding our uh, the value we get from our data, um, bring forward your problems to us. Uh, I know. Uh, that's one thing we're really interested in understanding is what are the problems you're having um, and what are the areas where you think we can help um, to solve those. Thank you for that. So uh, we'll wrap up. I do want to share just a couple things. Um, so I used to work in marketing research and we talked a little bit about data accuracy. Um, one of the things, if, if you have data that you're questioning, please do question it because uh, there are things that you need to be able to validate and sometimes data can be um, misleading, and it can change the business outcome of what you're trying to do. One very small example of that, and it's relevant even in the software world, um, this is not related to any of my time at Jamf, but I have encountered data sets where there's a default value, and the default value is zero. And it looks like they should be contributing to your sample size, so you think you have 1,000 people, and this many exhibit a behavior, and you're trying to analyze that. And the truth is that a fairly large sector of that has a null value, and, and they shouldn't be included in your analysis. And those are just some very simple things. If you're looking at how to validate data, just pay attention to some of those default values and some of those null values so you really understand what the data is telling you. And most of the analytics platforms will, will handle that, but it's the, the garbage in, garbage out, right? So you have to make sure that you're paying attention to some of that root data as part of that process. Um, now, if there's anything else anybody would like to say, um, I'll wrap things up completely. Very good. All right. Yeah. Well, um, again, a thank you to our sponsors, to our panelists. Um, they're down in the exhibit hall. Um, you can find them, talk to them about any of their solutions. We did have a nice, uh, nice cross-market group of different, uh, different solutions. So I hope that there's opportunities for you to learn more from them specifically. Um, and again, this does relate back to the whole Jamf and story. So we want to find out how we can make all these solutions uh, even more powerful with the things that we can create together, of course. Um, and to, again, the point of, of Matt, who I said it very, said it very nicely, uh, come to us with your problems because those are problems that we can put uh, all of our solutions uh, together to try to solve. So thank you very much. <laughs>